Investigators grapple with the case of a sexual sadist who's leaving behind painfully few clues. Even his victim is anonymous. When a woman steps out of her house and vanishes, detectives find evidence that she's never coming back. With no body, no witnesses, and scant clues, the truth about her fate hangs by a hair. A hideous crime comes to light in a remote river, but all evidence has been washed clean. Investigators have no hope of solving it unless the murderer strikes again. Greed, rage, and revenge provide most killers motivation, but some hunt just for sport. To catch these murderers, investigators must follow a trail of scattered clues. Beneath the gaze of California's Sierra Nevada mountains lies the resort community of Lake Tahoe. Clean air and majestic forests instill a sense of harmony. But for one lost traveler, this was the cruelest place on earth. On September 17, 1987, investigators from the El Dorado County Sheriff's Department were called to an isolated spot off the side of an abandoned service road. The young woman had been gagged with a scrap of pantyhose. Investigators found what they believed to be the murder weapon, a strangulation device made from a tree branch and a shred of the victim's clothing that appeared cut with scissors. Unlike a rope or bare hands, a garrote is primarily used for torture. The killer went to a good deal of trouble to find a place to stage his lengthy assault. Sergeant Jim Watson was surprised to find a body in such a remote spot. And at that point, it was just a big question mark in my mind. How did she get here? Where did she come from? A lot of unanswered questions at that point, and, but it was where we started. What they did know was that the killer must have picked this location ahead of time. The remote service road was hard to find, not a place one simply stumbled upon. And it wasn't chosen merely as a place to dump a body. The path was too steep for carrying the victim. The absence of injury to the soles of her feet told detectives that her shoes weren't removed until she was walked down here. Working outward in a spiral pattern, they scoured the ground for additional clues. We began a sweep of the entire area from here up to the highway, which is about a third of a mile. That sweep revealed pieces of clothing that were scattered on various bushes and trees from here up to the main highway. Technicians collected what they believed to be the remains of the victim's outfit, a dress, a pair of underwear, a single shoe, and pantyhose remnants. Not knowing what might be of use later, they also collected a pack of cigarettes and a butane lighter. Some white cord found nearby suggested that the killer restrained his victim before he killed her. Detectives had no clue to the victim's identity, nor any solid leads on her killer. They hoped the medical examiner would give them something they could use. 
The post-mortem examination placed her between the ages of 16 and 21. She had a large contusion on her head, but that wasn't the fatal injury. The ligature around her neck had ended her life. Based on the amount of decay, the medical examiner estimated that she had died two to four weeks earlier. No tissue was found under her fingernails. No foreign fluids were found on her body. Technicians used sticky tape to pick up trace fibers from textiles. They processed every square inch of the victim's clothing and cataloged each shred in the hopes that one day they'd find a source of comparison. But without a suspect, this trace evidence was useless. And until they could identify the victim, the murder investigation was at a standstill. A sadistic predator was free to roam and to kill again. Detectives scoured hundreds of missing persons records, but to no avail. The papers published an artist's rendering of the dead woman. Tips poured in from families and friends searching for missing teenage girls. One by one, each was eliminated. There was nothing to do but wait. As months passed, the missing person search gradually spread up the coast. It wasn't until four months later, in January 1988, that police got a call from a Seattle woman who recognized the girl. Dental records finally gave the victim a name. 17-year-old Darcy Frackenpole was a runaway from Seattle who tried to build a life in Sacramento. She ended up working as a prostitute. Friends last saw her on August 24th, three weeks before her body was found. For a predator looking to kill, prostitutes make easy targets. Night after night, they let strangers drive them into the darkness. Sometimes they don't come back. Investigators looked for similar attacks on prostitutes in the Sacramento area. One caught their attention. Three days before Darcy's body was found, another prostitute had a brutal run-in with a customer. While leaning over to lock the door, the man grabbed her wrists and attempted to handcuff her. But before he managed to subdue her, a police officer cruising in the neighborhood noticed the struggling couple and interceded. After the prostitute escaped from the car, the perpetrator tried to bolt but he was caught. Put your hands out the window. Out the window. Open the door. Slowly. Get your hands in the air, face the building, walk backwards. One good look at a bag found on his back seat told police that the prostitute had gotten away just in time. It contained a pair of scissors, handcuffs, and a garrote assembled from two wooden dowels and a length of white cord. It seemed to be some sort of crime kit. Police arrested the suspect, 48-year-old Roger Kibbe. A furniture maker by trade, Kibbe had a burglary record that spanned two decades. Illiterate but intelligent, acquaintances described him as a quiet man who liked to take long drives at night. He was given an eight-month sentence for assaulting the prostitute. While he was in prison, Darcy Frackenpole had been identified in Lake Tahoe, over 80 miles away, and the hunt was on for her killer. Kibbe's attack on the prostitute in Sacramento and his crime kit gave investigators the haunting suspicion that this wasn't his first strike. They didn't know how many women had made the mistake of climbing into Kibby's passenger seat. They wondered if Frackenpole was one of them. A garrote is an unusual and memorable weapon. Though the one found in Kibby's crime kit didn't resemble the makeshift device used to kill Frackenpole, 
the white cord used in its construction resembled the rope found at her murder scene. And like his assault victim in Sacramento, Brackenpole was a prostitute. Investigators questioned him, hoping that he would incriminate himself in the Frackenpole murder. He denied any involvement. Detective suspicions were purely circumstantial. The only thing they had to go on was the nylon cord. It deserved a closer look. Under the magnification of a stereo microscope, Technicians compared the cord samples from both Frackenpole's murder scene and Kibby's car. Both strands contained the same number of fibers made up of the same weave and pattern. Investigators discovered that this wasn't just household rope. It was parachute cord. They learned that Kibby worked at a storage facility and rented a unit there. They obtained a warrant to search it. Oh, yeah, right there. It's a skydiving certificate for Roger. They learned that he enjoyed skydiving, and when they removed a photograph from the wall, they made an unexpected discovery. The picture was hanging from a length of parachute cord, exactly like that found at both crime scenes. But it was hardly a smoking gun. Investigators found nothing to definitively link Kibby to the death of Darcy Frackenpole. This relatively common rope would not support the weight of a murder investigation. Unless they found more evidence, Kibby would be out of prison in just a few months and then would probably disappear. But tiny fibers might prove stronger than sturdy cord. Now that investigators had a suspect, they could compare the trace evidence originally collected from Frackenpole's clothing to fibers collected from Kibby. There are many serial type crimes that we don't have blood analysis or DNA analysis. And if there's not bullets or blood or semen, we have no other option other than to look at the particulate or the trace evidence. At the California Department of Justice Crime Lab, criminalist Faye Springer scrutinized the numerous fiber lifts taken from Darcy Frackenpole's clothing. Hours can be spent analyzing one square inch. After three weeks poring over the evidence, Springer found two fibers that stood out because of their larger size. The distinct shape and color of the fibers cross section told her that they were fibers from a blue nylon carpet. Here's where her 30 years experience paid off. She asked investigators to find out what kind of car Kibby had been driving at the time of the assault. A search warrant was executed and the suspect's car was taken in for inspection. Springer was on target. The floor mats were blue. What's more, one had a red stain on it. A sample was collected and sent for testing. The results were disappointing. It turned out to be pink. But the blue fibers from Kibby's car still had forensic value. A sample was compared with the fibers found on the victim's clothing. Not only were the shape and composition of the strands the same, a spectral dye analysis confirmed that they were exactly the same color. Was this proof that Darcy Frackenpole was in Kibby's vehicle? Not quite. The same blue carpeting could be found in tens of thousands of vehicles. If investigators were going to catch Kibby, they'd need something more conclusive. But one strange similarity couldn't be accounted for. Both the fibers from the car and the ones from the victim's clothing were peppered with tiny football-shaped specks. Samples of both were sent to a lab in Chicago that specializes in identifying microscopic contaminants. Until the results came back, investigators had no other evidence beside the parachute cord. As they began their careful scrutiny for something they might have overlooked, they realized that Kibby might have left behind just enough rope to hang himself. In California, Criminalist Faye Springer was trying to use three lengths of rope 
to lasso a killer. She examined the ropes under higher and higher magnification until she noticed something strange. The rope found at the Darcy Frackenpole murder scene had tiny red paint flecks in it. So did the cord from the garrote found in Roger Kibbe's car. So did the sample from his storage unit. Spectral analysis showed that the paint on the three cords had the same chemical composition, including some microscopic black specks that must have gotten trapped beneath the drying paint. It was a powerful connection. So it looked like not only did we have the same kind of cordage, but we had a cordage that lived or existed in the same environment, was exposed to the same kind of contaminants. For all intents and purposes, it was the same rope. But investigators needed more to tie up their case. That's when the call came from the testing lab in Chicago. They had finished analyzing the carpet fibers. The unidentified football shapes found on the carpet fibers were fungal spores, single-celled organisms that could have come from dirt or mold. But there was something else. The lab's powerful microscopes had identified a red spot on the carpet fiber found on the victim's clothes. It was paint. It had the same properties as the paint on the floor mat of Kibby's car. The carpet fibers weren't just similar. They were identical. Both contained the same football-shaped fungal spores and the same paint stains. The victim and suspect had now been irrefutably linked. What about the other one there? Roger Kibbe was arrested on April 25, 1988, for the murder of Darcy Frackenpole. By trial time, police had pieced together the details of the victim's last night. She had been working the streets when she accepted an invitation that would turn out to be a date with death. Investigators suspect that after restraining her with the parachute cord, Kibby brought her to a place he'd selected in advance. After cutting up her clothing and torturing her for several hours, he killed her, then scattered her clothes. Roger Kibbe was found guilty of murder in the first degree and sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. No one knows how many other victims met a fate similar to Darcy Frackenpole's. At least three other murders matching Roger Kibbe's M.O. are thought to be his work. Had it not been for a powerful microscope and some shrewd detective work, the number might still be rising. Roger Kibbe had covered his tracks by heading out in search of strangers, but not all predators hunt far from home. On a brisk October morning in 1992, neighbors saw Laura Hoteling leave the Bethesda, Maryland home that she shared with her mother. The 24-year-old Harvard graduate moved back after college and had no trouble finding a job at a consulting firm. But on this day, she never made it to work. A close friend and colleague went to check on her. Though the back door was open, she found the house empty. Anyone home? Laura? Laura? Someone didn't come to work today. There was no sign of Laura, nor any hint about where she'd gone. Laura, I know you're here. She contacted Laura's family, concerned that there was some sort of emergency. They were as puzzled as her friend. Laura's mother cut her business trip short. Neither she nor her son had any idea where Laura could be. She was not the type to run off without leaving word. Serious about her career, Laura was known for her diligence and punctuality. No burdensome secret seemed to be weighing on her mind. She didn't hint about leaving town. 
Her family filed a missing persons report with the Montgomery County Police. At this point, all Detective Ed Tarney could do was a routine check. We checked with the friends. They had not heard from her. She did not leave a note. It was just very suspicious. We also, uh, through the course of the investigation, we checked all her credit cards, bank accounts. There had been no activity. But as missing persons cases go, this was in its infancy. It had only been a few days since Laura Hoteling was last seen. Though there had been no sign of her, there hadn't been any indication of foul play either. Hey, how's it going, pal? Good. Police Good. interviewed the Hotelings' oh, friends, their neighbors, their gardener. No one could offer any information regarding yeah. the woman's disappearance. After seeing her leave for work the previous morning, there'd been no sign of Laura, nor any indication of trouble at her house. But then, as they searched the woods around the house, investigators found something that told them this was more than a missing persons case. The pillowcase and pillow inside it were stained with what appeared to be blood. When we took the bloody pillowcase back to the house, it matched up with the other pillowcases that were there. And at that time, we were, uh, we knew we had something very, very serious. To find out more about the stains, investigators turned to forensic scientist Susan Ballou at the Montgomery County Crime Lab. I take the pillowcase off the pillow. Okay. Ballou Get first the pillow. tested the stains to confirm that they were made by human blood. We wanted to see if we could pick up a type consistent with Laura. We knew from her donations to the Red Cross facility that she was a type A blood. The blood stain from the pillow was shown to be of the same type. From its bright red color, Baloo knew that she was looking at stains less than a week old. Though her findings could only prove that someone with type A blood had bled on Laura Hoteling's bedroom pillow, it was enough to turn the missing persons case into a potential homicide. Investigators needed to find out what had happened in Laura's room. Beneath the bedspread, they found something strange. There was a flat sheet on the bed, but the fitted sheet was gone. And on the mattress underneath were some faint stains that looked like more blood. Investigators saturated the mattress with a chemical called luminol. When it combines with blood proteins, even those invisible to the naked eye, it glows. Viewed in the dark, Laura's mattress radiated a pattern of blood spots and streaks that spelled murder. There was a large quantity of blood that showed up on that bed. That's when we knew uh, she was, had probably been murdered there in her bedroom. The lack of spatter on the surrounding walls or furniture told detectives that the killer had used the pillow to staunch the blood flow. The absence of a blood trail leading from the bedroom suggested that the killer had either cleaned his tracks or wrapped the body before removing it from the house. Investigators collected fibers and samples of Laura's hair in case they ever had the need to make a comparison. Meantime, technicians searched the pillowcase for any link to the suspect. A crucial detail surfaced. Based on the repeated pattern of triangular smears, they surmised that the killer had stabbed the victim with a narrow, pointed weapon, which was then wiped on the fabric. Hidden in the corner of the pillowcase, Baloo uncovered a more significant discovery. And when I looked at these areas closely, I could see partial impressions of prints on them, which turned out to be what's called a patent print, a print that is made in blood However, there was not sufficient ridge detail to get enough information from it. In its current state, the print was too vague to be used for identification. But criminalists like Baloo have ways of turning faint prints into glaring evidence. 
She applied a protein-sensitive dye to enhance the pattern. We'll see what we can do with it. Now that they had a viable print, all they needed was a suspect. I'm hold this here so I can rinse them more off. Mrs. Hodling couldn't think of anyone who would want to harm her daughter. She did recall, though, that their gardener, Haddon Clark, had been fascinated by Laura since his first day on the job. She also told police that she'd discovered her spare key was missing. Clark had worked for the family for several months. During the day, he was allowed in to use their bathroom or help himself to some coffee. Overnight, he lived out of a truck that he kept in a nearby church parking lot. How long have you been working for the hotel? Though Clark denied any knowledge of an attack on Laura Hoteling, his agitated behavior cast him in doubt. It wasn't Clark's first brush with the law. He had once been arrested on a burglary charge. When Clark's prints were compared against the patent print from the pillowcase, they matched. The suspicious gardener had left his print in wet blood on the victim's bedroom pillow. And the only way he could have done that, police contended, was if he had killed her. Though they still had no body, police arrested Clark on November 6, 1992. Inside his truck, along with his gardening tools, they found a hardware store receipt for carpenter's twine, duct tape, and plastic sheeting, ordinarily harmless materials that homicide investigators see more than their share of. Detectives believed that Clark was the killer. Proving it would be another matter. Despite the circumstantial evidence heaped against him, all police had was a bloody fingerprint. Clark's lawyers were already formulating their rebuttal. The homeless man regularly scavenged through trash in the woods. He could have easily left an innocent fingerprint on the pillowcase. It was up to the prosecution to prove otherwise. So at that point, we realized the fingerprint was not going to be the crux of this particular case, and we had to go further. Despite his dubious profile, detectives didn't have a single shred of physical evidence to tie Clark to the murder. And without a body, the case would be nearly impossible to prove. Investigators searched Clark's squalid campsite for a weapon, or even a body, but no weapons were found and the only bodies were the game he trapped for food. Detectives began to scour the place for tinier clues to prove Laura had been there, but realized that finding anything of value in this hovel would be impossible. The trial date was just weeks away. If the prosecution failed to convince a jury of Clark's guilt, they wouldn't be able to try him again, even if the body turned up later. And without any convincing evidence, it seemed their case against the gardener would wither on the vine. The trial date was drawing near, and Maryland investigators needed to find some physical link between Haddon Clark and the victim, Laura Hodling. Because the victim's body hadn't been found, the case would have to hinge on other evidence. Investigators were at a loss to determine what that evidence might be. While they searched the suspect's belongings, forensic technician Susan Ballou continued processing the evidence from the crime scene. In preparation for any possible hair comparison, Ballou inspected more than 90 hairs taken from the victim's hairbrush and made a shocking discovery. When I started to do that, I noticed that one of the fibers I put under the microscope was a wig fiber. And it just jumps out at you. It is so different from an actual hair, and it caught me off guard. May I speak to Ed Tarney, please? Baloo learned that none of the victim's family or friends owned or wore wigs. From receipts found in Clark's truck, Investigators learned of a storage facility that he rented in Rhode Island. Investigators realized that his penchant for dressing up might be the one thing that could finally expose him. Ed, what do you have for me? 
if technicians could prove that the single wig fiber found in the victim's brush had come from one of the suspect's wigs, they would be able to show that he had been at the scene of the crime disguised. Ballou pulled sample hair fibers from each of the 24 wigs and compared them to the single wig fiber found in the victim's hairbrush. After looking at under the microscope at all the different fibers from these wigs, I found one wig that the fiber from that wig had the same color composition, the same diameter. It also had the same internal characteristics as that one wig fiber that I recovered from that hairbrush. Now that Ballou had narrowed her search to one wig, she sent it with the original strand to a crime lab that specializes in hair testing. The last and most definitive test would compare the dyes in both samples. Though indistinguishable to the human eye, each wig manufactured in the U.S. has a unique fingerprint. Each of the approximately 7,000 commercial dyes is trademarked by the company that formulated it. The lab studied the samples under a microscope sensitive to ultraviolet rays. They called Baloo with their findings they were able to determine that that dye content in the wig as well as that question fiber recovered from the brush were in fact one and the same. Clark's defense attorneys couldn't get around this single strand of hair. Realizing he couldn't skirt the evidence, Clark confessed. He plea bargained to murder in the second degree. In exchange for the reduced charge, he agreed to reveal Laura Hoteling's grave located near his campsite. Clark admitted to having stabbed the victim with a pair of scissors. The autopsy concluded she was also suffocated. Ultimately, investigators pieced together her final hour. Driven by sick obsession, Clark learned that his victim would be alone while her mother was out of town. Using the spare key, he entered the house, smothered Hoteling with a pillow, then stabbed her in the neck. Clark must have rolled the body in the missing bedsheet, then wrapped it with the plastic and tape he'd purchased from the hardware store. He loaded the body in the truck and drove to a clearing near his campsite, where a shallow grave awaited. The following morning, Clark returned to the scene of the crime to clean up and cover his tracks. He figured that by posing as Laura Hoteling, he'd throw any nosy neighbors off his track. His last look in the mirror would prove his undoing. Without the ironclad forensic case against him, Clark probably would have never confessed. His victim's body might still be lying in a lonely grave, and Haddon Clark might have extended his killing streak. Thankfully, the devious killer couldn't escape the evidence. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Please hurry, he's trying to kill me. There's no telling where a trail of evidence might lead. Sometimes investigators stumble onto more than they bargained for. At 4.30 a.m. on January 21, 1995, the Marion County, Oregon police received a phone call from a prostitute named Lisa Louise Benson, who claimed to have been attacked. Benson was brought to the hospital for treatment. Lieutenant Bob Stye questioned her about the terrifying ordeal. She had ligature marks across her neck and um, also had an abrasion and the signs of bruising on the back of her neck, and had abrasions um, um, on her hands and up on her knees. Her injuries were photographed as evidence. Earlier that morning, she told investigators, a customer had tried to kill her. She'd never seen the man before, but he didn't appear threatening. She climbed into his truck.
He brought Benson to a retail carpet outlet. After roughing her up in an office, he forced her into the warehouse. He tied her to a forklift and told her she was going to die. And then hoisted her, literally hoisted uh, the lift up to where she was dangling with her feet about six or eight inches off the ground. She hung there for almost a minute. Then the rope broke and she fought her way free. The plastic wrap that bound her wrists was taken into evidence. Police learned from the carpet store manager that one employee, Larry Reed, fit the suspect's description. When Reed showed up to work the next day, police were there to meet him. He admitted that he'd picked up a hooker the night before, but when questioned about it, he became evasive and uncooperative. He refused to give any more information without an attorney present. Police heard all they needed. They arrested Reed for the attempted murder of Lisa Benson. A look into his background revealed a disturbing history of assaults on little girls and elderly women. He had been institutionalized more than once, but nothing, it seemed, could tame his instinct to prey on vulnerable females. Reed fit the profile of a sadistic sexual predator, but so far the case against him was based only on the word of a prostitute. To make the conviction stick, detectives needed physical evidence proving that he caused her injuries. They obtained a warrant to search the office where Benson claimed to have been attacked. They found blood spatter throughout the office. The pattern of droplets revealed repeated blows to the body, probably with a blunt instrument. The underside of the carpet disclosed two large blood stains, although the top of the carpet had been cleaned. Criminalists are often called on to build a case from a single drop of blood. In this case, however, they had copious amounts. They found more on the dashboard, glove compartment, and steering column of Reed's car. The evidence was sent to the lab. The results were anything but routine. Tests confirmed that all the samples were blood, but not a drop of it came from Lisa Benson. Investigators in Oregon faced an unnerving predicament. Their routine investigation into Lisa Benson's assault had exposed a much greater crime. Not only was Benson's blood a mismatch, the spatter and saturated carpet didn't correspond to her injuries. Forensics determined that the amount of bloodshed indicated that someone had been brutally murdered in the manager's office. Now they had a homicide investigation with no clues about the victim. They didn't even know when he or she was killed. They did, however, have a suspect, Larry Reed. His manager at the carpet warehouse told investigators that almost two months earlier, Reed had said he needed his carpet cleaned. Reed explained the situation to his boss. Mr. Reed had reported that a customer had come into the business during um, the evening hours of uh, December 7th, um, and that this person had complained about being sick and, and had gone into this office and had thrown up, and in throwing up, he had also thrown up some blood. The story was unlikely, but at least it gave investigators a time frame for the murder. A little research brought to light an unsolved murder in the next county. In December 1994, fishermen noticed something peculiar floating in the Santium River. Closer inspection revealed it was a body. Cool. 
They marked the location and contacted the sheriff's office. Investigators retrieved the nude body of a woman from the muddy water. Though the water had distorted her features beyond recognition, the numerous wounds to her head were plain to see. Someone had murdered this woman and dumped her body into the river. These murky depths, the killer hoped, would conspire to keep his secrets hidden forever. The medical examiner determined that the victim was around 40 years old. The degree of tissue decay and the amount of mud and algae coating the body told him that she'd been in the water for several weeks. Seven penetrating wounds had fractured her skull, inflicting fatal damage. From the size and magnitude of the wounds, the pathologist believed the murder weapon to be a tool with a hammerhead on one side and a cutting blade on the other. Identifying the victim would be a challenge. Because she had no fillings, there would be no dental records for comparison. And because of her time in the water, technicians were unable to render fingerprints by the standard inking method. But they had other ways. The hands were amputated according to standard scientific practice and sent to the police lab. There, highly detailed photographs of the fingertips were taken. These photographs were compared to a police database of fingerprints from women matching the victim's description. They came up with a match. The fingerprints belonged to Marjorie Lynn Sessions, a 38-year-old prostitute. Detectives from the Lynn County Sheriff's Office, which is south of us, advised that they were working a homicide case involving a woman named Margie Sessions. The detectives from Lynn County advised that um, Margie's lifestyle was one of uh, being involved with the methamphetamine use and uh, prostitution. December 7th, the same day that Reed reported the bloody carpet stain, was the day Marjorie Sessions had last been seen uh -huh. alive. Mm -hmm. Since both women were prostitutes, okay, it appeared and, uh, that his attack on Lisa Benson was part of his chilling pattern. And, we'll get this taken care of. and so it was those two significant um, facts that led detectives to um, kind of put the two cases together. Only a DNA test could definitively link Reed to the murder of Marjorie Sessions. If the victim's DNA matched DNA taken from the blood found at the carpet warehouse, investigators would have their man. It wasn't so easy. The victim had been in the river so long that the water degraded the DNA in her blood. But there was one last chance. In March 1995, three months after her death, the victim's body was exhumed. Technicians extracted dental pulp and bone marrow. From these samples, they generated a DNA barcode. In order to confirm that the DNA had not been degraded, technicians compared it against tissue samples from the victim's parents. The genetic pattern was intact. When tested against the blood samples from the suspect's office, it matched the DNA pattern for every stain collected. The blood work proved that Marjorie Sessions had been wounded in Larry Reed's office and that the suspect had transferred some of the blood to the interior of his vehicle. But it couldn't prove for a fact that Larry Reed had killed her. The only way to do that would be to establish a relationship between the suspect and the dumping of the body. Before they could solve this case, investigators had one more river to cross. In order to prove that Larry Reed had murdered Marjorie Sessions, detectives needed to show that the suspect was responsible for disposing of her body in the river. Scouring police records for similar attacks in the area, they made a crucial discovery. Back on December 7th, the day after Sessions was last seen alive, an illegal dumping report was filed in neighboring Polk County. Residents had reported a man fitting Reed's description, getting out of a pickup truck to dump trash along a roadside. 
make sure we get that tag. The bag, which bore traces of blood, contained blood-stained paper towels. Blood right Mixed among them was a single sheet of plastic shrink wrap. Nearby, investigators found a carpet remnant, also spotted with blood. They had no way to trace whose blood it was or who had dumped the trash there until now. Samples had been saved and were brought to the forensics lab. Each item was carefully studied. The single piece of plastic wrap was compared with the wrap collected from the Benson case. Criminalist Brad Putnam performed the analysis. The first thing we did was look at the class characteristics, the physical characteristics of the plastic. Is it clear? Is it colored? Is it uh, opaque? Can you see through it? Um, we took measurements of the thickness, of the width. Experts couldn't prove that the plastic wrap found at the dump site came from the same roll as the plastic used to gag Lisa Benson. But they were able to prove that it was identical to the wrap found at the factory where Reed worked. It was of the exact same shape, width, and coloring. Now that was real significant for us because uh, we knew Mr. Reed worked as a carpet salesman. We also knew that at the carpet store, uh, he had used plastic shrink wrap on Miss Benson to put around her mouth and around, around her throat. And we had the same type of plastic wrap found at the illegal dump site. The blood found on the carpet and paper towels sealed Reed's fate. It matched the blood found in his office. It had come from Marjorie Sessions. Based solely on forensic evidence, detectives had pieced together the details of her murder, from initial contact to the time her body entered the water. Forensic supported witness statements from the unlawful dumping. Uh, it uh, helped solidify some of the theories that may have been going on and really tied um, kind of a multi-jurisdictional nightmare into a nice, tidy package for the prosecution. Police believe that on the night of December 7th, Reed picked up Sessions at a bar. As he had done with Benson, he brought her back to his manager's office where things turned violent. Repeated blows to her head ended her life. Reed then dumped the body in the Santiam River. Even if she were eventually found, he thought, there would be no way to tie her to him. But Reed underestimated the power of forensics to draw a link with Marjorie Sessions, to coax DNA from the grave, and to turn flimsy bits of trash into an incontrovertible murder charge. Confronted with that much physical evidence, uh, it's pretty hard to deny involvement. Reed was sentenced to 40 years for the murder of Marjorie Sessions and the attack on Lisa Benson. Thanks to the forensics analysis, a case that seemed destined to go unsolved was proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. And a predator who may have gone on hunting for years was stopped in his tracks. Honing their skills with each attack, sadistic killers are some of the most difficult criminals to catch. Today, science is giving law enforcement the edge. With the use of advanced forensic techniques, investigators can build a solid case from the scattered clues they leave in their wake.